Hawaii is full of beauty no matter where you look, but there is a dark side to paradise hidden from plain view. It's a world where children, minors, those under 18 are trafficked for sex. The internet and social media hide stories of abuse, coercion, and despair. Advocates say Hawaii lacks a law mandating training that would help identify victims of sex trafficking. Is Hawaii doing enough? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Lari Yamada. Well, tonight is the second of two Insights episodes that examine the issue of sex trafficking in Hawaii. Now, two weeks ago, we focused on adult victims. Tonight, the conversation shifts to the sex trafficking of minors. Now, a contributing factor in this issue is a lack of awareness and or a reluctance to acknowledge the issue exists. Before we go uh, further, we want to share a couple of phone numbers with you uh, at this moment. The National Human Trafficking Hotline, that's the number on your screen right now, 888-373-7888. There are also some local numbers on Oahu, 832-1999, and the neighbor islands, 888-398-1188. We're going to show these numbers again before the end of the show. So our guests tonight include representatives from law enforcement, academia, and organizations that provide services for victims. So we look forward to your participation in tonight's show. As always, you can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you're going to find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. All right, now to our guests. Mira Chesney Lind is a criminal criminologist and professor of the Women's Studies Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She has been recognized nationally for her work on women and crime, including receiving an award for her most recent book, Fighting for Girls. Karen Radius is a retired family court judge and founder of an active supporter of Hawaii Girls Court, a program in the courts that works to empower female juvenile offenders to prevent them from becoming victims. Jessica Munoz is the founder and president of Ho'ola Na Pua, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to prevent child sex trafficking and provide care for children who have been exploited. And Lynn Costales is the acting first deputy prosecuting attorney for the city and county of Honolulu. She was on our previous show on sex trafficking and actively prosecutes sex trafficking cases involving minors and adult victims. So thank you so much for being here for such an important show and again for being here to continue this discussion. Um, so let's let's set this up a little bit first um, and feel free anyone to, to jump in just talk about the we talked about the definition of sex trafficking when we're talking about adults um, so there's some different things to talk about here when we're talking about um, sex trafficking of a child uh, who wants to jump in the, the laws um, right now referring yeah to the criminal laws involving child sex trafficking have everything to do with the age of the of the child so anyone under the age of 18 that is being advanced or into prostitution and or um, someone is profiting from their prostitution activities, um, that's considered sex trafficking in Hawaii. That is true on the federal level as well as on the state level. So it has everything to do with age of the child. There is no requirement for coercion, force, threats of force. It is simply an age. And what the thought is behind that is that, you know, anyone under the age of 18 cannot consent to engage in sex work. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what the law recognizes. Definitely more defined in that way. So, so what, what we're talking about as far as the range, the age range of victims here, mm -hmm. uh, when we're talking about minors. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. Pretty much I think the data shows that it can be a very young age. Right. So is the federal law that Trafficking Victims Protection Act first got started in 2000 on a federal level. And that originally was about women coming, being brought into the United States for sex work purposes. But then eventually there, in 2014, there was the protection of child and youth at risk for sex trafficking federal law mm -hmm. that set up a system about how do we deal with our kids that's happening, not necessarily, some brought in from other countries, but right 
Domestic. Uh, domestic. Domestically. Yeah. You know, the girl next door, the girl down the road, the girl that's not going to school, or the boy. So that federal law required each and every state's Department of Human Services to set up hotlines. Those are the numbers, the local numbers you gave within two years of that law getting passed. So since June 2017, we've had a hotline that the Department of Human Services runs. Uh, so the statistics from June 2017 through August 26, 2019 is the latest we have right now. There's been 171 calls that have come into that hotline. Just that one hotline. That one hotline. And it's from every island. Uh, there's been seven of those calls have been male. The rest have been fe about females. Mm -hmm. The youngest has been six years old, all the way till 17, almost about to turn 18. Mm -hmm. Uh, and from each and every island. Okay. So in prior to this law being passed, the look at family court was always, well, which kids got arrested for prostitution? Right. Generally on Oahu, that was about four to six cases a year. Period. Actually, in 2017, zero juveniles were arrested for prostitution. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, the, and, and earlier it was 11 juveniles arrested for prostitution. So what does that mean to you? It, it means that we don't arrest youth either for human trafficking or for pro, uh, prostitution. However, in that same time period, uh, we arrested, I'm just wanting to get the figures here, uh, we're arresting a large number of youth, 2,204, uh, 2,224 arrests of juveniles for runaway. Hmm. And runaway is where uh, these girls are found. And, you know, we can talk more about that runaway population, but uh, we, that's where they are. And, and that is a big part of the discussion, right, it is um, what they're possibly being lumped into and why that needs to um, be looked at more closely. Exactly. As yeah. far as what's really happening right. there. And what are the services available for kids who, why are they on the run? Right. How long do they run? How often do they run? What kind of services do they need? What kind of services do their family and surrounding adults need? Uh, the fact that the kids that are on the run and are often running for long periods of time. This is not two mm -hmm. hours to go to your grandmother's because you had a fight with your mother. You're not taking your birthday off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is... Chronic runaways. We've had runaways in girls' court that the last... They're 16 now. The last time they ever were enrolled and actually went to school was fifth grade. That child's been missing from our various systems since fifth grade. And I think the challenge with the runaways, I mean, the reason we're talking about it, you know, as Jessica knows, is that, you know, a lot of the kids in the runaway population are, not all of them are victims of trafficking. I mean, right. that is that is clear and I think that's an important thing to push out mm -hmm. is that not all right. runaways are victims of trafficking but they certainly are right high risk yeah they're high they're risk. at risk of trafficking because they are out on the street and they're being exposed to things that make them at risk for someone to prey upon them mm -hmm. I mean it's as simple as that so um, what are you what are you seeing Jessica because this is the core of your program what are you seeing and um, so we see these stories? kids come from a variety of backgrounds it, they could be runaways, they could be kids that go to private school, they can be kids that live in Section 8 housing. It really knows no socioeconomic barriers or boundaries. Um, the other thing that we see is, yes, the runaway population is a significant part of, especially with one of our programs, our mentoring program, we work with a lot of girls who are high risk. And so our goal is that if they have a first time running or a second time running, that we're there to try to be that safety net to hopefully prevent them from running again. Yeah, what, what do you mean by high risk? So kids that um, clearly they're running from something to something else. So whether they're running from an abusive home or they're running to someone that they've, some romantic interest that they have, or you know, these guys are very, and gals are very good at what they do in their recruiting process. So sometimes you have kids that don't realize what they're getting into and mm -hmm. they're leaving the safety net of maybe, you know, whatever resemblance of family that they may have and going into something that they don't realize what's going to be asked of them. 
And so what they might perceive as a boyfriend or a very loving relationship or somebody who's going to take care of them is really running into the arms of another abuser. Mm -hmm. But when you're 13 or 14 years old, you don't realize that. I mean, the child brain, your brain doesn't fully form until you're 25 where you really can process risk and process logically. And so a lot of times um, these kids, that vulnerability that they have, it's easy for them to be conned, to be swayed into a life that they really aren't necessarily choosing. The other thing is a large percentage have been sexually abused as yep. young children, three and four and six and seven, right. and, and or there's dysfunction going on or drug use going on in the neighborhood or the family mm -hmm. they're in and sometimes some of the sex trafficking is a, a family member or someone yeah. offering right. the child up for drugs or for money to get drugs and it becomes a part of the way of life. Um, and I think that you've, you've mentioned that uh, the tendency is to want to say well Yes, maybe, but that's not happening in our backyard. Mm. But a lot of who you're seeing, they are... They come from a variety of backgrounds. And that's what we always tell parents. It, it's not just one type of child that this can happen to. It really, I mean, any child can be at risk. Yeah. And it's definitely happening in our community. Um, there's no doubt about mm -hmm. that. I think everybody right. at this table is well aware that it is occurring in our community. So the calls that have come into the hotline come from every single zip code we have, mm -hmm. every island we have, <laughs> and mm -hmm. so. So even when you kind of flip it around, you say, okay, who are the people who are you know, buying these children? Is there some kind of a profile or something? But it, it kind of goes the same route where you can't really put a profile on it per se. Mm -hmm. So Arizona State University did a study, uh, their second study, that was put out the beginning of this year. And it looked at, um, they interviewed women who were trafficked as children. And some of the common themes that came from that study was a history of violence at home, of yeah. sexual abuse at home, of um, substance use going on at home. And a lot of those things were the things that catapulted them as young girls mm -hmm. out into this life of being exploited multiple times over. And when they talk about the individuals who have bought them, paid for them to have sex with them. Um, they came from a variety of backgrounds. They can be physicians, they can be attorneys, they can be legislators, they can be law enforcement, they can be, um, they can be your average swim coach. I mean, it literally, mm -hmm. it, there, there isn't a discrepancy. And why do you think that is? Why do you think it's so broad? What do you think is happening that's allowing it to dif disperse in such a way well, prostitution is the oldest crime, uh, you know, in, in our history. And there's always been um, a market for uh, sex. sex. And um, the women who are involved and the girls who are involved are out there because it's a way to make money. So it's not really, you know, despite movies that we've seen that, you know, stress the sexuality of these relationships, like Pretty Woman, I think, was one. Uh, the reality is it's, it's uh, as uh, Jessica said, it's a kind of predatory environment that the girls find themselves in. They do link up with other kids. They try and survive on the streets. But a chunk, and what that chunk is of the, in Hawaii, of the kids that were interviewed uh, that were homeless street youth, uh, about 15% uh, engaged in some kind of sexual activity, uh, trading sex maybe for a place to stay, for some food, for some mm -hmm. money. Um, nationally, the estimates are that about 2% of youth engage in this behavior. And the people who buy them um, are like, uh, think about uh, Jeffrey Epstein in you know, the, that scandal. Uh, no, so I think people have these stereotypes of sort of sleazy yeah. guys, you know, hang, lurking in corners. Uh, but that's not the reality. The reality is other, a lot of people. Me, the other thing is with the growth of the internet and social media and the dark web, it's no longer just that's walk right. along Kalakala Avenue and that's the it's only place like you're going to find either. somebody. Uh, I mean, a it, lot of a lot of it happens online. Yeah. That's where it starts. I, mm. Mm. I mean, I have I have met many of victims, young girls who have. 
basically got into it mm -hmm. starting online. Just, you know, social media is so prolific now yeah. with our culture, uh, not just for the young kids, you know, mm -hmm. but, but the young adults, you know, are very much engaged and everything is online. And sometimes that helps and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point because you, you have a, you think initially, well, it provides a cloak for the predator, but you have this generation or the generations coming up now right. that their comfort level is, um, is so mm -hmm. um, high mm -hmm. that they, they're just there. They're it just exposes there. them. Well, and I think so much, yeah. back to what you were saying about why does, why do we have people looking to have sex with kids? you have to look at, well, one of the driving factors is pornography. And oh, so yeah. if you have... You're leading to, uh, you, boy, did you, just, did you see this question? <laughs> no. so, is there any connection between sex trafficking and pornography? Yeah, I mean, it's a yeah. driver, and it's been proven in many studies that the more visualization becomes actualization, and the market is showing the demand for younger and younger kids. And, um, you know, I think that's something that has to be addressed. I mean, if you have kids that are getting um, into pornography at 10, 11, 12 years old where they're seeing it for the first time and then, you know, that addiction, I mean, it's an addiction. Pornography is an a addiction. Addiction and a desensitization. Yeah. 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 I mean, a lot right. of it is pop, pop culture, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at, you know, the way we, you know, kids are watching videos of their, you know, uh, of pop stars that they really like. And it kind of glamorizes yeah. mm -hmm. the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that glamorization of the lifestyle is very attractive to somebody who's 14, 15. And you know, and you see all of that, the, the gold chains and the things that are, are very hip for them and, and their, in, in their group of friends. And so that also kind of glamorizes the whole thing. And so it, they don't see the dangers of what it really is, because that's what it is. It is, it's definitely not a glamorous lifestyle. And I mean, I think even yeah. Pretty Woman, oh, you yeah. know, if you're, you know, in, in that genre, we knew that in that movie, it wasn't a glamorous thing. And, but there is a very sidious side of, of this lifestyle that I think most kids don't really appreciate, you know, until they're in it and then it's too late. And the question is if you are out on the streets, hungry, cold, and that's a little bit and different. And no connection to anybody, right. the first person who comes up and offers you, come with me, you're so beautiful, let's go to a party. Yeah. And the first day may not be anything more than a party, mm -hmm. but it leads into right. other stuff and then I mean, we've had girls who've had tattoos on their chest, cash only. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. Talk about when that girl wakes up, even though she's trying to get out, she looks in the mirror and it says cash only. Wow. It becomes her identity. Yes. Yeah. And so getting out, and if you've been, if you've done this since you're 14 and now you're 18 and you're trying to get out, it's all I've ever done. Mm -hmm. and when the girls come to you, and they explain sort of what happened and up to the point of finally coming to you. What are, what are they telling you as far as? There's what? a lot of shame. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of stigma. Um, there's a lot of fear. They don't want anyone to necessarily know. Um, but there's also not really a recognition that they've even been victims of a crime. They do not see themselves as victims and, of a crime. And it's almost as if they made a bad choice. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, back to what um, mm -hmm. both Lynn so and Judge Radius were saying, you know, if you are a young kid and you're out there needing to survive, you know, I'm not a big fan of the word survival sex because I believe that if the adult that sees this child in need and knows this child needs help and doesn't do something but instead engages in a sexual activity to give the child a place to stay or something to eat, they're no different in my mind than somebody who's trafficking them because they're exploiting them in their time of need. Absolutely, and the federal legal definition of no. sex trafficking for minors, it doesn't have yeah. to be money that changes, anything of value right. yeah. is, is, is so what, are, what are you seeing as far as um, these cases actually being prosecuted? Uh, you know, the cases are not many. Um, I and think why there do are. You think that is? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons for that. I think Jessica kind of hit it on, you know, the nail on the head when she says that there's a lot of stigma to it. It is not. 
I mean, to be clear, being a victim of trafficking, whether you're an adult or you're a child, especially if you're a child, you know, to, to make that disclosure to people who are strangers to you Definitely. is not an easy task. And it's not just, you know, that level of comfort in, in making that disclosure, but it has a lot to do with, you know, how am I going to per be perceived? What are they going to think of me? Mm -hmm. But to actually disclose some very intimate things that happen to you to a, a stranger is, is Difficult for an adult. Can you imagine if you're 13 or 14 and having have, to disclose that? That is not easy at and all. And if I have to be a witness at a trial and yeah. the, the, the purchaser or the purveyor is sitting across from me at a table, will I be safe? Will my sisters be safe? There are threats to if you do this, if you turn me in, I know um, where your sister you know, lives. And a lot of it I know too where is, your mother lives. And so, is bond, I mean, you know, some of them feel very um, connected to their trafficker. That's the person that has been taking care of them. That is the person that they believe loved them and cared for them. And they were going to ride off into the yep. sunset right. together. But it, that's not always true. I mean, from the trafficker's point of view, it's definitely not true. But um, not all, not but all girls victim, who, are, who are in this situation have traffickers. Correct. And so that's another issue. Uh, so you're kind of turning yourself in. And as we've been saying, there are not robust services for this population. So mm -hmm. why would you go into a system that's going to stigmatize you, that in, in our society we're very ambivalent about sexuality, we tend to blame women uh, if they get into these sexual situations, uh, there's terrible shame associated with having been a prostitute. So um, you stay away. And then we have some complicated, um, you know, just dynamics with these exploiters uh, because, again, they, they were seen as friends. They were seen as people that helped me on the street. So they're, when they're told you have to testify against this person, they're typically not interested, and those are the cases that are very hard for prosecutors to deal with because you don't have a compelling witness. So we have some more than we used to have. In 2016, the state law changed that there were mandated reporters, which are school teachers, pediatricians, coaches in sports, um, licensed professionals, therapists, doctors, pediatricians. We have a related question. I'm supposed to be sure calling. Oh, go ahead. What training or resources are available for teachers to help spot the signs of possible victims? So when you talk about um, they're now um, tied a little bit more into this process, what then is there to help them if they're being asked to get more so there's engaged? there's beginning to be something. There's some training going into the school. DOE has, we've developed a Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children Steering Committee, which is state agencies that deal with this issue, which is Department of Health, Family Court, uh, Department of Human Services, Department of Education, the systems that touch kids, and as well as law enforcement people. Uh, the Department of Education, for the very first time this year, put in their teacher training uh, a training piece on mandated reporting for sex trafficking, mm -hmm. which is call that number. DHS is supposed to be sending out people to investigate. And they also get referred to Susanna Wesley, which has the yep. Traffic Victim Victims Assistance Program, TVAP. Um, you said this year, that was the first time. That was the or first time they were training. So the, training. the mandated reporting started at the end of 2016. So we've been doing that two plus years. Uh, by law, but as far as the training, Department of Human Services has been going out and doing some training. Uh, yeah. We need some more money to but be able to get the trainers out there. Mm -hmm. Nonprofits have been going out and doing, everybody is stretching as much as they can. Um, this is a problem that's a health problem, an education problem, a mental health problem. And you a talk juvenile about justice program for working with the entire family. This yes. isn't just about absolutely the minor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So there are some things. There's there's lots you can find out online if you Google about sex trafficking for minors. There are committees and uh, for free internet Plus webinars the, uh, and things. The girls' court. Now this is this is really something that you. 
um, or at the heart of. Yeah, Mm -hmm. well, I don't know if that hard, but it's my baby, yeah, (laughs) I admit. So actually we have our 15th year anniversary coming up this month. Yeah, how's how's the program been going? What's been the outcome so far? Yeah, so basically it started out with oh my goodness, juvenile justice doesn't do right by girls, and what yep. can we do? So we took the 10 hardest girls in the, we took 10 pro- female probation officers in their 10 hard- in their one hardest case each, and we started out with them, and let's figure out something better. So girls' court wraps around the kids with not just, they come to court once a month, their parents ha- or other, supportive adult has to agree to come to court, but it's not just coming to court and it's not just when you're in trouble. It's finding out about you and what can we do to support you in making a plan for your life to do better things. Uh, So kids get back in school. We've got kids in college right now. We've got kids who've gotten clean, kids who've not had babies till they were married. We've never had a baby born dirty in 15 years, thank God. Although sometimes girls still get pregnant under 18. That's not our main goal, but but the babies have all been born clean, the ones that have been born. Um, so we have statistics that, yes, this helps, but it's, it's a one therapy not only for the girls, but for the family members and right. family relationships. Girls are a lot about relationships. It's not just put a a pink bow in the courtroom. Well, I think the other aspects of that uh, girls' court model was getting the cohort together so that the girls interact with each other, which is not typically the way juvenile justice is done, and getting the parents to work together. I think that was another Mm -hmm. uh, phenomenal aspect of the court. And it's a national model, um, so really kudos to Karen for... And she built it out of the, the drug court model. So there's yes. a lot more interaction yeah. between the client and the judge than your typical every six months, you know, have you been going to school? Have you been obeying your parents? Yeah. It was really a lot more about really getting to yeah. and, know and the kid. positive reinforcement when they do something good and a lot about talking about truth. Mm. I'd much rather know that something happened and you've fallen back and what caused that and how do we... How do we get so you can move on from that? Mm-hmm. And so how do you realize your trust. Po- how much do you realize yeah. your possibility? And there's so many more opportunities for girls in this world than there used to be. That's but true. for girls that are had trauma in their life before, had a rest in their life, had some and family been going dysfunction to and haven't been going to school yeah. or having been getting expelled from school a lot for fighting or other things. Most of the girls' arrests are more self-harm and family-type harm, some abuse of household members. They get in a fight with their parents and beat up their parents, or the, but their parents might have been beating them up in the past. Uh, so there's not, a, there's not girls going out with Uzis to 7-Eleven and robbing, <laughs> robbing them. And I think we've been, we've been talking a lot about, and there's a lot of focus here on um, girls, um, yes. and girls, but I think in recent years we've been learning more and more about just how yep. big the population may be of of young boys yes um or trans for them too. Um, uh, right population and, yep. and and i can't help but wonder if it it doesn't seem like as big of a population just simply because there hasn't been a, as much attention and research in that area of need probably well, a little bit more hidden i would think uh, oh yeah there's uh, you talk yeah. about shame for yeah. girls uh, especially for boys this is Mm-hmm. can be traumatic, but you also have trans youth involved right, in right. this population, and, uh, and that's a complicated, and, and many of those uh, trans youth are engaged in prostitution as a way to survive. And there's also a, a kind of validation of trans women, especially, or trans girls, as, you know, you're being seen as female, and so you might be somewhat more attracted to prostitution because at least it affirms that you're sexually appealing to the opposite sex as a trans girl. Um, But it's very dangerous. And that's the other thing you want to stress is uh, how physical, how, how, what a common theme being assaulted and being victimized on the streets is for the kids that are involved in this. It's, It's a dangerous place to be, which is another reason that they have complicated relationships with the people who are uh, facilitating the behavior because they need places to stay. They need to be protected while they're out. Mm-hmm. 
those are all issues. So our emergency room sees these kids, our, our OBGYNs, once you get them in a way that they're ready to see a doctor and work with a doctor, what and, it does to And while to we're them talking, I want to throw up these hotline numbers again, sure, just please. to make sure that people understand that, that there are some numbers to call um, that have people who are experienced in dealing with this. The National Human Trafficking Hotline is the first number you see there, the 888-373-7888. And then we also have some local numbers too, right here in Hawaii, uh, that you can call on Oahu 832-1999 and neighbor islands, 888-398-1188. So let's talk about uh, the efforts um, uh, to help and to get other agencies involved that need to help because obviously this is this is really everybody that needs to collaborate and, and there was a big push um, this year as also in some previous years in the legislative session to um, to add more um, meat on the bones to the laws and and one of them was um, getting more training or mandating training mm -hmm. for law enforcement um, that didn't go the distance um, what what happened and and why do you think the outcome was what it was you know I I didn't participate this year in the legislative session as much as I had in the past, but you know, the thing with law enforcement is that we're a little particular. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's easier, it's often easier for law enforcement to hear from other law enforcement. So I think um, law enforcement generally had a, you know, some, some reservation about that particular bill only because it was being introduced by non-law enforcement agencies. And so law enforcement is going to have very specific issues. Um, for them, they need to be able to recognize, you know, not in theory what trafficking mm -hmm. is, but really what it looks like when you're out and about, when you're seeing that person on the side of the street. It has a lot to do with recognizing trafficking when you're being confronted by other types of crimes. I can't tell you how many cases that I have looked at that have started off as domestic violence. And so it's typically just a, a guy and a girl believed to be boyfriend and girlfriend that are having a domestic dispute. But you have to be able to dig deeper into that to, to see that it's actually a trafficking situation because it's not going to present as the obvious, uh, it's a trafficking situation. And you talk, talk oftentimes the, the, the call is on that it's a runaway. It's a runaway. As it's far as a we're sex talking about assault. Minors. It's yeah. a domestic yeah. violence dispute. I mm -hmm. mean, it's drugs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, law enforcement is always going to, it's always easier for them to hear from other law enforcement officers, agencies that have experience in it. Um, not so much, you know, we've gotten better. <laughs> We're, we could always use some improvement, but we've gotten better about collaborating with service providers. So here's a, here's a quick question, caller witness, two young girls, just kind of putting a scenario mm -hmm. out there and, and the challenges involved. Caller witness, two young girls getting into a car under suspicious circumstances. Mm -hmm. She called police with license plate number, but police told her there was nothing they could do. What else is the public supposed to do in a situation like this? So put, sort of, so, so um, explain sort of the situation there and I mean, why you might it's Get a very response. Yeah, I mean that's a very dynamic situation that's going on. You suspect something, but you don't necessarily know if it's anything. It could be teenagers just going out, and it's a bunch of friends. Um, you don't know. So if I think from a law enforcement perspective, that might be a very difficult thing for them to run down because you don't know, and they are still bound by the law. You know, they can't go out and like sure. arrest everybody <laughs> and stop everybody just because. They have to have some degree of suspicion that something illegal has occurred. And that may not necessarily give rise to that. Nonetheless, when you look at the hotline numbers, um, a lot of times it's not always going to give rise to a law enforcement response, but it certainly is enough to call in um, and voice your concern. Mm -hmm. You give as much information to the people that are on the other side of the line um, so that at least it can get documented. Maybe somebody can track down that license plate and figure out what's going on. So, from hearing from the from the other side, from the from the uh, girls and sometimes the boys uh, that are out there, and why they might not um, uh, 
take an opportunity if they if they want to reach out to law enforcement or somebody to help why they why they wouldn't what what might you want included in the conversation if we're talking about um, you know building a, a more robust training program for law enforcement and other responders what would you want them to think about um, as part of that training to help them understand how they can um, uh, make themselves more um, open I guess or I don't want to use the word welcoming to, to victims, but. So I think part of it is you're working with a highly traumatized population. And so oftentimes these kids, if law enforcement were to pull up alongside of them or you know stop them or intervene, most of the time these kids are pissed off for lack of a better word, and <laughs> they might be cussing at you and not and acting like, I don't need your help, I don't need you. And so realizing that that's layered in mm -hmm. multiple experiences, whether it's it, not necessarily with other law enforcement, but with apparent adults who were supposed to be protecting them, keeping them safe. And so the system as a whole has often failed these kids. Right. So they have lost trust. They've lost trust in the juvenile justice, in child welfare, in, um, in law enforcement as well. And so part of it is um, the way that that approaches in this trauma-informed lens of understanding that, again, like we just said, these kids don't often see themselves as victims. They see themselves out there trying to survive, um, trying to be involved in something where they feel attachment to, they feel accepted, they feel loved, they feel valued. And so... Um, or scared. Or scared, or scared to get out. Well, so is that one of the challenges of building um, so oh, yeah. considered an acceptable training program? Yeah, there's so a you, couple of things. One is, we used to have a juvenile services division in the Honolulu Police Department. It, when that big national conference came, international conference, years and years ago, it was disbanded. It has finally begun to be reconstituted. That's We're going to have eight officers mm -hmm. that'll be juvenile services officers. They're going to be going through some of this training. Four of the eight are hired so far. Um, we don't have enough policemen. The policemen that are out on police officers. Police officers, yes, I'm <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, police, men and women. The police officers that are out on the beat, they're trying to close cases, right? They're pushed, get done, get, you know. So the, the whole, it's not just training, it's time to be yep. able to talk and be seen as somebody that the, the child or the parents or anybody can trust. Sometimes the parents don't trust the police because, okay, I'm, all I can do is hold my child close or move away from Hawaii um, because. Well, kids on the run also, um, they don't want to be returned home. They yes. have ambivalent yeah. relationships or even negative relationships yeah. with police officers. Sometimes, um, you know, they see that as the person who's going to return them to the abusive home. So that the officers need to be trained. We, but we also need, I, I, I worked with the police officers, um, and I remember when we started doing stuff, stuff with girls, they were so frustrated because they were working with girls and the girls would self-disclose that they were se being sexually abused at home. And then those officers would know that we have, you know, we've gotten better, but we had nothing for those girls. And the officers got very frustrated. It was like, I don't even want to pick her up because I know what she's going to tell me and I there's nothing for her. So I think this all backs up into better training for law enforcement done by the appropriate people who you know, who are experts that maybe come in from law, other law enforcement communities, yeah. uh, bring that perspective. But then services that are, that are gender re responsive for the girls, but also people who have experience working with LGBTQ uh, mm -hmm. communities, because those are the kids that are out on the streets too, um, and, make, and make sure that we, we have an array of services. Right now we've got a little smattering of services and got wonderful uh, organizations that are trying to be girl specific but for how many decades we've arrested thousands and thousands of girls for runaway and done nothing for them uh, except put them in detention center or put them in HYCF where and we're we we've stopped doing that but we're still the services are still thin on the ground so I think not only do we want to see money for training but hopefully also money for services Absolutely. and an array of services as you say we're building this continuum of care 
for for kids. I think. And, well, go go. Sorry. The other the other thing I just wanted to add um, in relation to law enforcement, I think a big piece that could be very helpful is having um, those who are have survived this as part of that response. So having that survivor advocate mm. that's there. Um, when some of those initial interactions happen because there's an instant rapport that can take place because of that. Boy, you are just hitting these uh, <laughs> viewers on the nose. David yes. from Honolulu saying, do the youth participate in designing these programs since mm. the other kids are um, resisting the program sometimes? Uh, so are you, so that is, um, you believe it needs to happen. Are you seeing that in some situations or are there um, certain um, organizations, yours I would imagine, that, that um, that introduce that, that peer level um, participation or engagement. Mm -hmm. I would imagine um, that's gonna be, have yes. a big impact. So Tammy, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago, she is um, a peer-to-peer -peer support specialist for us and she meets with a lot of the kids that we work with and having that experience as um, a, a survivor who's overcome so much gives a lot of hope for kids, that they can see you can move beyond this, that you can move past this. And Project Cal Calaho, mm -hmm. which means a new pathway, which is a Department of Health project that started with federal funding and now has some state funding, so it's smaller, unfortunately, than it was in the beginning. Uh, they had a lot of peer specialists and kids in mm -hmm. that have been through the mental health system that were 20, 21, and beginning to do well on their own, working as part-time employees. So what are they able to do when you have um, kids working with kids? How does that change the dynamic, and what have you seen happen because of it? So ours are the adults. We have mostly adults that work with kids. We don't really have... Um, or maybe young adults yeah, working like with. young adults, yeah. but not kids mentoring kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see what they do in detention and youth corrections, you know, they... That's a very dynamic situation yeah. as well. <laughs> and it's also finding the person who's had the problems but has become healthy enough... It's very hard. ...to, yeah. to want right. to work with these kids and not regress themselves then. Right. Um, so there's that. But some of it is you want to have help for the particular kid, at some point you're praying that what you've done with them creates enough healthiness that they don't need you anymore or want to be part of you anymore <laughs> because they've moved on in life. So it's, it's a real, it's an interesting dynamic. It's a very dynamic situation to have kids working with kids. I mean, I think I can see that I, I don't as think being an you're extremely not, you're challenging. Not, you're not having 17 work with 15, it's more right. like Young 18, adults, 21, yeah. 22, so somebody who looks like and feels mm -hmm. like they fit in. I know on the girls' court thing, uh, a lot of the activities that the kids go to, they're court ordered to do things that include community service, et cetera, and will do things at UH or at community colleges so they can see young people who look like them and say, oh, there geez, is maybe I could do this. and. You know, maybe I could, you know, I look like her, she looks like I could do this. And, uh, On that note, too, maybe what about um, the challenges between different cultural um, issues? How, how, how much is that playing a role in who you're able to get to and or what barriers that may or may not create? I can just give you the runaway, the characteristics of the youth that we arrest for runaway uh, about the highest number of, of youth involved in runaway behavior are Caucasians at 31 percent, followed closely by Native Hawaiians at 25 percent. So you're dealing, and different cultural groups have radically different numbers in this at-risk population, if you will. So um, certainly working with Native Hawaiian girls, I think, would be uh, working within Native Hawaiian um, organizations and maybe tapping those organizations for mentoring for um, other kinds of so you know re knitting their connections to their culture and using the culture as a resource um, broadening and luckily the concept of ohana is there in the hawaiian community so you could broaden the definition of family to include other people in her life or his life um, that's you know that's just one example of 
maybe culturally informed programming, mm -hmm. uh, especially with Native Hawaiian youth who are just as exposed. So, so on the call-ins on the hotline so far, 33% of those have been part Hawaiian, um, which is the highest cultural group. Uh, but so what else are you uh, moving toward as far as we talked about uh, what came up to the legislature as far as uh, additional training um, or uh, more robust training for, for law enforcement or more engagement. What, what, what else um, is really standing out as far as where the effort needs to be or where the, the, the likely next step can be uh, based on um, the resources you may be able to get, the partners who are becoming more willing to work with you? Where are you seeing this going? Yeah. I mean, I, I will say that currently in the community, you know, there are a lot of good efforts. You know, I mean, Judge Radius talked about the um, CSEC steering committee that she runs. There is a CSEC multidisciplinary team that was formed such that they can, you know, work on these cases and it's law enforcement and other service providers. Um, they are kind of a, a smaller group that can dig into the weeds of cases. Um, there are task force, there is a Honolulu um, County Human Trafficking Task Force that deals with child and adult labor and sex. I mean, so there are a lot of good efforts that are out there. There's I think for all of us, Center, yeah. yeah, I think for all of us who work in this area, resources is always gonna be an issue. Right. I mean, it is a high burnout um, area to work in if you're working with this population and dealing with them on a regular basis, it does take a lot of work and a lot of energy. So I think everything, everyone from more prosecutors to more police to more um, service providers, more people that work in every one of these respective right. agencies would be key. But where does that funding come from, right? It is always the challenge. And placement. Right, and I mean, placement. placement is a huge component. Right. Kids, if they don't feel safe, they're not going to be able to start processing right. their trauma, developing those healthy mm -hmm. attachments and relationships. And right now we struggle with placement. We can lock kids up, we Ugh. can put them in detention. Yep. I mean, that, yep. but that we put them in foster care. We struggle with having enough foster homes as it is, let alone those to take in highly traumatized children. We don't have residential treatment for this population, which we should. Um, as an option for kids who need that level of care. Um, but then you have kids that are transitioning at 18, 19 that we say, oh, they're no longer kids, now yeah. they're adults. But the reality is they haven't had the level of therapeutic intervention that they need. And so then we're sending them out to try to make it in this world. And, and, and if, there, if there is no place for these kids to go and start that healing process, it makes trying to get a successful prosecution challenging because the victim isn't ready to testify. They're not willing and they're not ready and they can't, yeah, they're that's scared. Have there been a case that's been successfully prosecuted? Yep. There have been cases that have been successfully prosecuted. Not of recent, you know, not in the last year or two, but in the past, yeah. What was the sure. difference? Um, you know, I think when I saw those victims, you know, they were, um, they were at a place where they were looking to have a different life. And so when they encountered law enforcement, they were ready. They were ready to make that disclosure, whether that was fear that was driving them because they were abused, whether that was just too long being, you know, on drugs and just needing a break, they were ready. A lot of times it takes, you know, good service providers, you know, that can wrap around them and give them that kind of support. They need to feel, they, they need to feel safe. And in those cases, they felt that the, that the system as a whole, and when I say that, I'm talking from law enforcement down to service providers, that the system was caring for them and was supportive enough such that they felt comfortable going forward. And that I think was key for a lot of them. Some of them regress, we understand that, and we're okay with that. We wrap around them anyway, because nobody's perfect and we understand that. Um, but we are there for them when they are ready. And I think that was key in those cases to be successful. Um, it's not an easy route, mind you, mm -hmm. but you know, some, some kids, some adult women, when they are ready, um, it's their time and we want to be ready for them when they are. And I think that's really important as a system 
that we are mindful of that as we're moving forward. So the other question is it's not just the title sex trafficking. You know, the pornography, there was just a recent yep. successful federal prosecution of a pornography case. Uh, there's been another state one that recently that there was the sting and four guys are in state court as potential customers of a, a sting with set up. Um, law enforcement played sort of the, hello, I'm a kid, and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they came to Manoa Park and eight people were arrested, four are in federal court, four are in state court. There's some guilty pleas coming out of those kind of things. So that wasn't a we busted a big sex trafficker who had a cache of 100 girls under his... his uh, <laughs> Although we would like to get them. Yes, we would <laughs> like to get that one, All right, and, and his brother, uh, or her brother. <laughs> so the, the, right now, the funds that are... There's the funds for training, there's the funds for law enforcement, there's the funds for services, both residential as well as treatment services as far as counseling, medical health, mental health, et cetera. Department of Human Services does have some budget that they have put out an RFP that's been awarded to Susanna Wesley, which is the traffic victim assistant, TVAP, Traffic Victims Assistance Program. So as you look, so you look forward to the next, be more. the next few months, the next year, what's, like what's sort of the strategy um, based on what you've experienced <laughs> either at the legislature this past year um, or with um, the, the glimmers you've seen as far as with the collaboration and the, and the voices that are starting to come out. Um, how are you seeing the next, um, you know, several months, the next year play out in a way that um, really can um, bring a little more resources in and bring a little bit more collaboration together and get the voices being heard? I, I would say one thing we need to um, understand better is how this subpopulation of runaway youth uh, who are engaged in uh, CSE uh, differs, uh, what are the uh, services that are uniquely theirs, and so a needs assessment maybe of this population would might be a good thing to do. Um, and then once you, once you understand those needs, better tailoring the services that are out there and better coordinating the services that are out there. Girls have just been ignored. I think Judge Rady has said it quite eloquently. Um, we, they've been suffering for decades without any services. We're, we're building a system. Um, and, and admittedly, there are transgender youth and also LGBTQ youth uh, who also desperately need services. And again, they've been neglected. And how, how are we comparing nationally? How is that? We well, actually, our, run, our overall arrests are going down, so we have, we should have uh, services, money for services for this population because they're a bigger chunk. Uh, you know, I'm just going to go back to 52% of all female juvenile arrests are explained by one offense, runaway. So okay. over half the girls in our system are in this at-risk population. So where are you seeing some traction? So I think there's a couple things. One, there has never been this level of awareness around this, this space, and right. uh, Meta brought it up with Epstein. I think that's a big thing, right? The shock waves are out there. People understand this is real, it's happening, it's happening in this community. I think the other thing is it's proving that um, when things are disjointed, resources aren't getting to kids. And so I think a big component to what we need here in our state is a statewide coordination, that there's truly an entity or a, a state entity that is in charge of, because it's not just Oahu, right? We have, this happens on every single island. And is there some groundwork for that? Yes, there is groundwork being done um, to really see so, an entity have that statewide coordination of bringing together NGOs, law enforcement. We've been looking at models from Virginia and Texas. Connecticut Minnesota. and Texas and Minnesota came, mm -hmm. people came for three days and we did a three day full day trainings uh, from them. So we're not the only state in the country with this problem and we may be a little bit further behind and slower Oh. So you're getting more people to the table now. Yes. And there's a lot of dialogue, and that's yeah. the important yeah. thing. The dialogue is important that we all have between state agencies, government agencies, and, and NGOs. Mm -hmm. That's and, the and important thing. you mentioned that even though the last session was challenging, it got a lot of voices. 
Yeah, a lot of voices. Yeah, there's heard. more people coming forward, and it's important to have yeah. those voices mm -hmm. because everybody has a point of view, and we need to hear it because we're all learning from each other. Perhaps a more cohesive voice would be nice, <laughs> um, and we might be more effective that way. You know, but but at least the dialogue is happening, and I think that's the mm -hmm. important thing that we have to remember. We've only got 30 seconds left, but but Jessica, I just wanted you to to, to, to reach out to folks who are listening, maybe who who may not know what to do, um, whether it's um, girls or young boys or their families, nursing, I'm scared. I don't want to take that next step and come out and talk about it. You need to find somebody to talk to. There, you have to come forward and say something. You don't necessarily have to disclose everything, but saying that you need help, there's no weakness in that. Yeah. And yes, it's vulnerable, but it can save your life. We've we'll got some numbers here for you. Go uh, once again. Here are the phone numbers that we mentioned earlier: the National Human Trafficking Hotline, 888-373-7888, and right here in the islands, locally on Oahu, you can call 832-1999, and another number for the neighbor islands, 888-398-1188. So thank you so much, all of you, thank for joining you. us. Such an important topic that needs to continue as you're doing. Our guest, uh, Meta Chesney uh, Lynn, criminologist and professor in the Women's Studies Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Jessica Munoz, founder and president of Ho'olana Pua. Karen Radius, retired judge and founder and active supporter of Hawaii Girls Court. And Lynn Costales, acting first deputy prosecuting attorney for the city and county of Honolulu. Thank you all again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next week on Insights, the state's road usage charge proposal, a per mile charge instead of a gas tax to help maintain and fix state roadways. Join us then. I'm Laurie Amato for Insights on PBS Hawaii, and we hope.